some of the things that we have learned along the way, uh, sort of dispatches from the front of starting up IXPs in different local communities with different needs. Uh, so we're, we're a CCTLD operator. Clearly we have uh, a, a incentive and motivation to have a high functioning internet in our landscape. And when we looked around in the Canadian context, because not only do we uh, sell domain names and resolve DNS queries, uh, part of our mandate is also to do good stuff for the Canadian internet landscape. So when we looked around uh, for projects to get involved in that could be sort of the highest net benefit for the resources we had available, uh, what we identified is internet exchange points, or our internet exchange points. And we identified them because in the Canadian context, we really didn't have very many. We were seriously under-indexed in the number and strength of internet exchange points in our country. And that's for a number of reasons. Legacy, historical, much of the traffic goes north-south, there are robust exchange points in the U.S., etc. But the fact is we didn't have many. So we actually commissioned uh, Bill Woodcock and BCH to do some research for us, started to identify some of the key centers that could have the biggest bang for the buck, and started the process of trying to help internet exchange points go live in Canada. And we did that by bringing, well, I think, I was going to say the one fundamental thing that we can bring, but of course it's, there's two. But the one fundamental thing we could bring was a neutral, bias-free space where we could bring competitors and other uh, internet community members together in kind of a safe, open, transparent space where competitors could look at each other and not be concerned that there was uh, some other underlying motivation at play. So we brought that to the table. And of course, the other thing we brought was a little cash, which, uh, which always helps in a party. Um, but seriously, what we brought is the conversation, and we brought it to Montreal, which didn't have an exchange point. We brought it to Calgary, which didn't have an exchange point. We brought it to Winnipeg, a smaller center in Canada, and really just started the conversation in a neutral, safe space and brought together the community members. Um, and I'm not going to say surprising, but there was a certain surprise in how fast that flame lit, that fire lit, when we just sparked them. Uh, and literally inside less than a year, uh, we have an up and running, fully functional, quite robust internet exchange point in Montreal. Uh, we have uh, another smaller, much more local one, up and running in Winnipeg. Um, also in Calgary, in fact in Calgary we seem to have ended up with two. Uh, and we've started some really good discussions in the Vancouver market. So in very short order, we've started to build uh, a fairly robust IXP fabric in Canada, certainly something that we didn't have uh, a little over a year ago. And we've learned some things along the way. Key things are, are certainly around not the technology, which people often think about in IXPs, but really around the governance and the membership of it. And, and the threads that we certainly see in all of them are um, typically not-for-profit, member-based. You know, as Martin just said, the community has to get involved to make these things work. Um, and each one has its own local flavor. What's worked and ended up happening in Montreal is very different than what's worked in Winnipeg, a smaller center. And yet, they're both successfully achieving the same end goal, which is uh, bringing a community together to peer successfully and drive the advantages of resiliency and performance and better economics. Because that was the other material benefit that we were trying to bring to the Canadian landscape, which, um, like some, is very much dominated by incumbent telcos who often don't play nice and don't appear openly. And as a result, in an environment that's typically a duopoly, regional duopoly environment, um, pricing can be out of whack with the competitive landscape. And we've seen what's happened 
on the ground in the last year where uh, pricing in Winnipeg and Calgary could be seven to fifteen dollars a meg we've seen it drop to two to five inside a year so for the local internet community the ISP and of course the end users they're already starting to experience dramatic results and part of the reason why when these IXPs lit up, we were able to bring transit providers in who would not have been there otherwise. And uh, one of them is sitting just to my left. Hurricane um, has been a great partner in this. And by them entering the markets, and I'll let, I'll let Martin speak to this on his own, but I think in part because the IXPs got set up, they changed the market dynamic by becoming that third main player and completely changing the competitive landscape. So the IXP has been a key catalyst for doing that. So we've learned some great things by uh, being participants on the ground. We'll be happy to share more later. Thanks very much, uh, Byron. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I work with the Pacific Institute of Public Policy we're a think tank. We don't run IXPs. Um, but uh, I, 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 what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about our experience in Vanuatu, which is a least developed country, extremely small, a quarter million people, total population for the country. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping that I can provide a little bit of insight uh, for those people who are in similar circumstances where, you know, you're coming from zero, basically, from no internet to the, you know, the best possible internet that you can have today. Um, the first conversation um, around IXPs happened about four and a half years ago when uh, the telecoms regulator and I had a very brief chat and we realized that what we needed was a switch. Um, it was pretty much that simple. And what we got four years, four and a half years later, um, fills about a quarter of a full, a full rack. You know, we've got a, a bunch of little units. We'll have a few more boxes before we're done. Um, but what we've achieved is a reduction of uh, uh, latency that's, that's really quite remarkable. Everything goes through satellite in, in Vanuatu, so we go up to the satellite, down to Sydney, back up to the satellite, and 150 meters from your own door. Um, creates about one and a half, 1.2 seconds of latency in every local transaction. So the, the, technically, the prospect of an IXP was a, was a gimme, you know, it was blatantly obvious. And yet, it took us years to get everybody around, you know, get their heads around the idea. And the reason is that you really have to work, you, you can't make any assumptions. Um, the way I tend to explain it is that, you know, this is landscape, not architecture. Um, the architecture itself is trivially easy. The landscape, creating a place for on which the architecture can rest, is something else entirely. And we found that we had to work through building awareness, building understanding, um, and that's a deep understanding not only of the technical issues, but also of the local circumstances that we were dealing with. Going from there to active education, you know, to, to start to pinpointing very specific issues that, uh, that we wanted to address, and finally to commitment, and quite frankly, that was the hardest part of all. Um, building enough trust between the players, as has been noted, telcos don't tend to play nicely together. Um, and in a very small room, that can uh, result in a lot of shouting, and it did on a few occasions. So the, the interesting thing was that we got the interconnect agreements um, moving long before we actually got the exchange point, you know, the physical place where they could, where the, the, the ISPs could actually connect. Um, and it was through that trust building process that we finally got the circumstances necessary. When it finally came down to it, the entire installation period of you know, the, the time it took us to get it up and running was about two weeks. Um, so what I would like to say really is I, I'd encourage anybody who's working on internet exchanges in developing countries, especially least developed countries like my own, um, 
is, you, you know, you will spend infinitely longer talking and, you know, than, than building. And the temptation is always to say, to heck with it, I'm just going to put the bloody thing in place. That doesn't work in my experience. You, the, the, that four and a half years minus two weeks was not optional. Um, the amount of talking and the range of, of people, stakeholders that you need to talk with, is it, it's quite astounding. You know, it, it works right across the board. Um, and so, please, you know, do exercise a lot of patience. Um, talk a lot and with everybody and gratuitously, uh, because the end result will always be better um, than if you just go ahead. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, over to you, Maria. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm not running, I'm not just running with the exchange point, but I'm running with company that has a long history in censorship and surveillance. So it is, it is a former uh, agency that was used by, by, by the regime for the Soviet rights and the Soviet people. So what's happening after the revolution is that we had two, uh, two options. First, is to abolish the agency and forget about it. And the second option is to protect the infrastructure that we have because it is only infrastructure that can be used as an exchange point and as an, an IP transit service provider for the whole country because we are routing all the traffic for Tunisia. So at that time it was really important because it was a good decision we made with society saying that we need to promote this infrastructure and we need to clarify everything. So that's why I'm proud to be here and also to say that we founded an internet exchange point based on best practices. Now Phoenix B will be an association very soon, before the end of the year. We founded Phoenix B, which is Tunisian Internet Exchange Point, which, which is the first internet exchange point in the Maghreb, so North Africa, but you can uh, uh, five countries in the uh, North Africa but in the West. So uh, it is the first internet exchange point in the in Maghreb and it is uh, based on best practices. It's created on our consideration with best practices. We can say that we clarify the role with ITI because ITI is a company. Of course, it's the name is an agency, but it is because of the form, what we used to do during the revolution, before the revolution. And uh, now, if we change the name, it will, it will become a company for IP transit service provider, which is independent from, from the Internet Exchange Point, because the members of the Internet Exchange Point will be the, uh, responsible to manage all the infrastructure in the neutral panel. We want to be independent from the incumbent, we want it to be according to best practices. I want to highlight this first because you, to, we need to know that uh, it, it, it wasn't really easy for the challenge. Uh, first, we have bad laws. We know very well that with the communication coding area competition in the market. We had uh, internet regulatory text since 1996, since the creation of IGI. And uh, it mentioned IGI as a regulatory body. So imagine an agency which is in charge of censorship, of surveillance, of CCTFD, like you know, and uh, also Internet Exchange Point, and uh, IP transfer service provider, Internet service provider for the government, so everything. We're hosting also the all the critical infrastructure for Internet, so it's a huge company. It's very, very powerful during the regime. So now what you want is to, to create the power of this company and clarify its rule. We cannot be of everything in a centralized manner. It was like a barrier for the development of the internet. So we forgot about the regulatory text. We ignored them at all. This was uh, a decision made by, our, by the board of the company. We say this is our text. We will challenge the court if there is something wrong with those texts. And we try to also to push the government to not regulate, actually. Yes, in order to make it easy, all the reforms and so on. Unfortunately, they, they amend the telecommunication code in 2013, and by chance it was just after two weeks after we launched the internet to the XP and to become member of Rovix. They said, okay, an internet exchange point needed a authorization. Just after we launched it, after we registered in the Rovix database. And okay, we said, okay, no problem, but. Uh, we are running an internet exchange point since 1996, so the authorization is already given by, by, by Bernard before, so we are using that. So we don't need your authorization to, to today. And the second thing is that we, when we transform to the agency, it's a new model, 
in the telecommunication in Tunisia, we don't have any agency that is involved in operating things. It is for us very clear in the code that if you need to operate a network or to operate equipment, you need an authorization from the ministry. So actually, we are still challenging things. We know very well, but uh, in a positive way, because we know that we, this is best practices. So we want to, through best practices, try to advocate new regulatory reforms in terms of internet. Because we don't need an internet exchange point that doesn't need to be regulated. It's based on the consensus of the actor. And we try to convince all the actors, including the incumbent operator, and including another operator, which we, I don't want to mention the name, but it is from an European country, but we want to have all the traffic of Tunisia without connecting to the internet exchange point. We said, we're going to do it. All the actors will be with us. If you want to join, you join. If you don't want to join, you won't do anything. But we will use the media for that. So society with us, the community now is aware of all the challenges that we are doing. And the community is also helping us to advocate for those principles. Internet Exchange Point is not just a person or an entity or a company. It's also a matter of community. Thank you. Thanks very much, boys. Sebastian. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> yeah, my, my name is Sebastian Belagaba. I'm the Regional Bureau Director for Latin America and Caribbean at the Internet Society. A couple of things, and uh, we're working a lot at uh, ISOC and in, the, in our region to try to help and develop uh, IHPs. Uh, for us, it's a critical part because it's been said, I mean, it's been mentioned by my predecessors here at, at the final, but um, the um, most important thing is uh, of uh, the creation of IHP, at, at least in our region, I think it applies globally, is that uh, we try to keep the local traffic local. Uh, and that's an, an important thing. If you look at Latin America, Latin America and the Caribbean, you cannot look here, here, but it just made the main picture of, the, of, of uh, our region. Um, it's a very long region, big distance. And the network topology today is that basically we all interconnect in Miami. So from Argentina to Miami, we have like 8,000 kilometers. Uh, so we have to go to Miami and back to Bolivia, another 7,000 kilometers back. Uh, we have fiber. I mean, it's not the case that you have in Vanuatu that you have to rely on, on, on satellites. So small part of the, of the continent you have satellite connectivity. But, uh, most of the, of the region is connected to, to fiber, uh, but still the distances are huge. So that implies a lot of things. I mean, that implies latency problems, as we mentioned. It's not that much, it's not more than a second, but we have uh, very huge latency problems. Uh, uh, the, um, but also implies some economic issues, um, and that's something that we'd like to, to point out. Uh, but we there is mainly two things. One is the the, uh, the non-existence of an IHP in a, in a given country makes that the hosting is not hosted. The content is not hosted in the country because it makes no sense. If you have two ISPs in one country and the people and a user is connected to ISP one and the content is in ISP two and you have to go all the way to Miami and back, that would make no sense. The incentive for the content provider is to host the content in Miami. So we have just one jump to go and, and, and go back. So there is a, a, a problem of, of incentive there. So the, the right incentive today is to, to host the content, the, the content in Miami. That is inefficient from a, a technology perspective, but it's also inefficient in, a, in an economic way because for those links, you're also using a hard currency, which we know that we come from developing countries that had currency is not easy to get. Um, so we are spending big bucks in transferring bits that could have been exchanged uh, in our country using local currency instead of uh, local currency. As it's been said before, uh, the creation of an IHP, we're working today in several IHPs, even or the creation of, of the first one or leveling up the, the ones, the existing ones. Uh, and, but the both processes, I would say more, more than the creation of an IHP, is uh, it's hard. But it's not hard in the technical aspects. I mean, as said by my colleague from, from Vanuatu, 
we, we used to say that 20% uh, of our integration of IHP is um, technical engineering, and 80% 80 80 is social engineering. Um, it's, that's, that's key. I mean, what's been mentioned, and I don't want to go again, but I totally agree with, with your experience. And working with the people, working with all the stakeholders is key. I mean, in other words, it would not work. I mean, we have many experiences of uh, face IHPs too. We have some success stories uh, to, to share, but uh, I would not focus on the success today. I mean, I, I, I think the, 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 uh, there, there's a lot of uh, lessons uh, learned from, from bad experiences that are very valuable because of that. One is that keep a lot of time involve all the stakeholders, uh, otherwise it could not work. And we uh, also uh, recommend the, in, in our regions because we share cultural aspects, we share languages, we share whatever we, we share with our neighbors. Uh, neighbors sorry. Um, we also like to uh, get people together. You know, the, the, uh, the, those are, that are uh, driving IHPs today, at least in, in, in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, have uh, get together two years ago in order to create a federation of IHPs uh, operators, which is called LAC-IX, uh, which also is very, very, uh, very good practice because they can share good experiences and, and problems there. And, and I'm also glad to, to, to tell you that that developed into uh, a world federation of IHP operators now that is, I mean, has the representatives of the Asia Pacific area, the uh, European IXP operators, the Latin American and Caribbean now, and I think the Africans are joining too, uh, or, or they join, or, or they're joining. So uh, that, that I think is uh, another forum that is important to, to, to create. So uh, if I have the time later on, I would uh, tell you about uh, bad experiences too. Uh, in my previous life, uh, I, I had set up the uh, first IHP in, in, in Latin America and, and the Caribbean, which is the Argentine one. Uh, we created the IHP in 1998. Um, there was, I mean, there's a, it is a complete success. Uh, we, today in Argentina, they have uh, 12 or 13 IHPs in the country, run by the same organization, I mean, they spread geographically all around the country, uh, which is good. I mean, there is a lot of figures that I can share with you, but there's price drop, the latency drop, I mean, there's a lot of success, but in the meantime, I mean, the way to get there was really hard, and, and we made big mistakes, and if I have the time later on, I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Uh, final presentation. Is from okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Bevel Wooding from Packing Clearinghouse. I'm the Caribbean Outreach Manager at Packing Clearinghouse, and um, we began looking at the Caribbean region in around 2004 um, in terms of education and outreach concerning internet exchange points and a lot of what has been shared so far uh, has actually also been the reality on the ground in the Caribbean. So I'll just focus on a, a few points concerning um, what we've gotten out of the experience and where things are at now, which I think would be um, useful for this discussion. So the first point is the whole issue of starting the conversation. Um, the, the region was characterized by uh, a single large monopoly telecom provider and a number of very small providers. And when we started, um, the position was that, well, the network of the dominant provider was the sufficient, um, was sufficient for routing internet traffic, which of course was the dominant provider's perspective on it. And so the first thing that we had to do was to expand the audience um, of that conversation. Who was having conversations about internet traffic routing efficiencies? Um, what were, what were the, the, the key points underlying the economics of um, routing practices. And um, once that happened, once we moved it out of a discussion between the internet service providers and made it a national discussion and a regional development conversation, uh, the momentum for internet exchange points transformed. And so we moved from a, a place where back then there would have been just two or three exchange points, so now we have over 14 countries either started or starting um, the launch of exchange points. Um, a big part of engaging that wider audience was tailoring the message about the value proposition for exchange points. Uh, there are a number of technical and non-technical benefits that are often referenced for exchange points. Each of these really speaks to different audiences in different ways. 
for some countries the issue was the security matter, um, being able to, to protect or to have a greater feeling of protection concerning internet traffic, um, local traffic remaining local, um, and therefore not being subject to foreign interrogation was a big incentive for um, several of the governments. And so that became their incentive for um, either mandating or strongly encouraging the service providers to keep local traffic local. Uh, for others, it was the promise of the internet economy being able to grow the local internet economy and the opportunities for young persons who wanted to start internet-based jobs without having to leave uh, the region. Uh, that, of course, depended on a stable and, um, and well-developed uh, local infrastructure and on local hosting, neither of which uh, are very uh, promising when you're, when you're pushing this out and using the Miami, Miami as the, um, the exchange. So, depending on the territory, we actually tailored the message to, to, to speak to the, the relevant local priorities, and that made a huge difference. Um, so, the economic incentives, the social incentives, the security incentives were all part of the, the message that we had to use. And then, of course, the, the issue that I think everybody has referred to so far education, um, putting information out in the public space, considering not just internet exchange points, but beyond that, um, the role of of, of how do you build the, the internet economy, what constitutes an effective domestic internet economy was a message that we had to craft and to, 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 um, to communicate to the audiences. This involved doing something that, was, that is not common in the Caribbean and that is getting the, the media involved in a technology conversation. Um, there, there isn't, as to this point, a very strong culture of reporting on technology matters. And the more technical, the less likely. And so we had to, to make IXPs are not technical discussion. IXPs became content. Content became cultural preservation. Um, cultural preservation became national identity. Um, national identity became national development. And so wrapped inside of that social conversation was the issue of, hey, if we deal with this foundational issue, how we exchange local traffic, then we have a, a much better chance of building on all of these things that everyone says they would like to see, but they're not seeing because of certain uh, realities. So, um, engaging the media meant um, tailoring the message, uh, masking the technical um, with a set of non-technical messages that are, are relevant but depend on somebody taking care of technical issues. Um, but at the end of the day, of course, uh, in that exchange points are about service providers dealing with um, connecting their networks and exchanging traffic. And so we had to engage the providers. As I said, the, the landscape across the region really is, is one where while there is competition in the telecom space, and fierce competition at that, uh, there wasn't a very strong history of collaboration between the providers. And, um, and while we, we started off the message to the service providers talking about the network efficiencies and the engineering efficiencies, we realized that that was not having the kind of impact that we thought it would. They were not concerned about the technical or engineering efficiencies. Further investigation showed that the, the telecom providers were actually profiting from the inefficiencies. They all have profit centers in Miami. So whereas we're saying for the country that you're, you're exporting scarce foreign capital, for the telecom providers, they were double dipping. They were getting money out of the local market and they were collecting revenues um, at the de facto exchange point, which was Miami. And they were very happy about that situation. That was not a problem. And so the, the whole issue of getting the other players to amplify the need for a local um, efficiency or a local exchange point to deal with local challenges uh, was something that we had to do. So while talking to the providers, we had to make sure that sufficient noise was being made in the local environment concerning the impact of the absence of exchange points on advancing the internet economy, the local or domestic internet economy. And that has, that has taken a couple of years, but now we're at a point where uh, the providers can no longer put this information out into the environment, nor can they any longer deny that exchange points are a valuable part of a robust and healthy local environment. And, um, and we now officially have the support of, of, I would say, almost all of the, the, the telecom providers in the region considering exchange point proliferation. Um, the next, the next uh, issue that I wanted to just to point to is the whole issue of getting to the technical community. Uh, when we started, there was no novel network operating group in the Caribbean. There was no um, local um, organization of, 
of technical or network engineers, and we had to create one. So Carib now, the Caribbean network operators group was formed and is now three years old, and that has been another key part of transforming the culture from within the ISBs by creating a cadre of more mature, better informed engineers, network engineers, who can then say to their non-technical managers, hey, this thing is actually impacting performance, which is impacting quality of service, which is impacting customer satisfaction. And so we had to train the engineers to carry the right conversations within the organizations to, to those who are most who have to make the decisions about peering. And so we are at that good point to a stage now where we can talk about the real issues. Let's generate local content. Um, let's have a peering forum in the Caribbean, which we'll have for the first time uh, in 2040. And let's really look at the issue of how we optimize traffic exchange at a regional level and at a national level to, to, um, to get the, the, the benefits that have been talked about in the economy realized at home. A final piece inside of it is, of course, also engaging the academic community and ensuring that this, this process is properly recorded. Um, a big part of, the, of creating the momentum that we now have um, involved profiling and celebrating the successes in the countries that went to first um, and making it clear that there is no threat of market collapse or there is no, um, none of the, 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 the concerns that, that attended um, providers large providers allowing smaller providers to pay um, for the absence of local content being a disincentive for local traffic exchange. Uh, when we turned on the Grenada exchange, Grenada is a country with I think around 125, 140,000 persons. It's a small market. And the, the concern raised by, raised by the large incumbent was that uh, this is not with the effort. The market is too small. There is no content exchange. And on the first, within the first week of that exchange point um, being lit up and activated, uh, there was traffic. There was five megs of traffic without advertising, without telling any of the local content providers to put their stuff on. Just the general transfer of data between the incumbent and the, the next competitor proved the point that there was traffic to exchange. And within a month, it was now economically viable for the, the, the both service providers to actually continue to build out the exchange. That created a wonderful story to take to the other territories. And we use that story um, to get effect in creating the momentum. So getting the academic community involved, getting the graphs, maps, charts, data about how the process um, unfolds um, is another key part in um, getting exchange points up and running and convincing the participants of the value of the uh, Thanks very much, Bevel. Uh, I'd like to give the opportunity for the uh, panelists to react to presentations that were made. Um, and perhaps I could just kick it off with a couple of points of clarification here. Um, Bevel, I wonder if you could um, elaborate a little bit on a rather interesting point about uh, the uh, operators not being in the same way, the The other provider um, was not as, um, as as keen to stop, and so we had to make it not an economic issue, but a, a national development issue, and get the, the regulator involved, which is something I actually don't support or advocate, um, but in the case of the, the region, the operators themselves were saying they wouldn't do anything except the, the regulator got into the picture and required it as part of their system, and so we, we had to do that get the regulator involved, warn the regulator about um, 
not being too prescriptive or too specific in in what they needed the ISPs to do. And so we, we got this wonderful compromise where the regulator simply mandated that if traffic is intended for local audience, then it must remain local. Um, and that was guaranteed in the case of British Virgin Islands and, um, and compliance one. Um, but that issue of the economic incentive, I think, is, is, um, is, was an important lesson for us. Someone was making money, and so profit trumped network efficiency. Uh, and so that was not a strong argument for us in terms of why exchange, an exchange where it had to be formed in the markets where those providers were operating. And so we had to change it from the economic value proposition of exchange points to the social value proposition. Exchange points promote the development of a healthy and robust domestic in an economy in an environment where economic factors are uh, um, moving against traditional forms of, of economic growth, which would be tourism and agriculture. We have to look for non-traditional forms. It then represents a wonderful uh, platform for new forms of economic growth and development and human resource uh, utilization. And that became the, the incentive point for establishing exchanges in a number of the Caribbean territories. Thanks very much, Pamela. Uh, you have the members of the panel at that, please. Sorry, just a quick note to add to what Bevel was saying. Um, in our in our experience, uh, we found that creating reference interconnect agreements um, was a, a really good way to sort of set a normative standard from which you know the, the providers uh, and, and telcos could negotiate with one another. It, it sort of set the tone of the conversation. We found it quite a useful instrument uh, in getting things rolling. I think interestingly in the Canadian uh, context we had basically the same situation uh, that we just heard in spite of the fact that we're not an island and we're a relatively uh, developed digital economy and the issue for us is the, the incumbent is not only or one of the regional incumbents, the largest one, is not only an ISP but a major transit provider. They very specifically refuse to peer openly in Canada at this point and will peer only in various uh, U.S. peering environments. So what ends up happening is that the local, smaller, and mid-sized ISPs, if they want to peer with the incumbent, are forced to peer with them in Texas or Chicago or Seattle. Um, and from a geography standpoint, those are all far away. Um, so we end up with some of the same issues. But one of the key threads that, uh, that isn't often talked about is who is the primary transit provider who will happily sell you that transit? And we have that double dipping situation where if you want, if you as a small, mid sized, or other entity that needs to peer with the incumbent, you have to do it in the US because that's the only place they'll do it with you. And who's going to sell you the transit to get there? They will happily do that. Uh, so that's a dynamic that we experience as well. I just want to touch on one other point that uh, Bell made. And in a sense, it's around the, the chicken and egg argument around starting an IXP. Because the content providers all say, well, I'm not going to show up unless you have X traffic. And the people who can deliver the traffic say, well, there's no content providers there. Why should I show up? And it, I mean, it's a, it's a classic startup problem, regardless of the IXP. Um, and that's one I'd be interested in hearing how people have resolved that. I know the experiences we had. You know, for us as the CCTLD operator with good relations with the Googles and Akamai's and such for other reasons, we're able to leverage that and bring them to the table at a time that they might not have done so otherwise. And we also brought, we're also a member, so we bring our own zone servers, we brought uh, NTP servers as well. So we brought something that then uh, could also help attract content providers, and that started it in our environment, but that's only in part because we were a CCTLD operator who could bring some bits and pieces that were of value to others. Uh, thanks, Byron. Um, just to clarify then on how, how do you deal with the issue of the incumbent uh, unwilling to be able to they still not be alert? Uh, no, that is a work in progress. <laughs> And we bring some of our other friends here on the panel to help hopefully uh, catalyze or focus their attention on this issue. Thanks for the money. That's fascinating.
Thank you. And I take Byron's intervention just to enter into the uh, the experience of failure that I mentioned. <laughs> yeah, because we have the IHP in Argentina, we didn't deal with them. I mean, basically, they were forbidden to be in the IHP. This is 15 years ago. Okay? And the role of the content providers, I mean, uh, the size of the content providers, uh, were quite different. Most of the content was hosted in the IHPs. So uh, it, was a, it was a different environment. But uh, we required that um, in Argentina, you require a, a license to be an ISP, And the license was required to be part of the IHP. Uh, so with this, with that, that would uh, mean that some incumbent and the biggest carriers will join the IXP because we were not competing with them for their contract they have with the content providers. So there was a compromise, and I, I don't mean that it's the uh, ideal situation. I mean that's the way we did it. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm about to say it didn't work well. Uh, the both uh, Argentina by regulation and uh, the privatizations uh, process in Argentina end up with two instead of one state monopoly with two private monopolies. I mean, one in the north and one in the south. That's the way they they uh, deregulate the market. Uh, and ten years later, another place where it were were allowed. So there were two incumbents in Argentina at that time, and they were part of the original IHP in, in, in Argentina. In Cavani. Uh, at the IXP was very particular. It was a kind of cooperative. Everyone has to pay a share of the cost, and that's it. There was no fee. I mean, there was no commercial purpose of the IXP either. And um, the type of agreement between the parties was not a peering, actually. It was a, it was, um, a multilateral mandatory kind of agreement. Everyone should open all the domestic routes, and they are. Uh, so it's multilateral, all of them should open all the domestic account, uh, routes, meaning not the international ones, just the domestic ones, and they were obliged to, at least by was mandatory. The five years later, in 2003, the um, two incumbents, one major carrier and the biggest ISP and content provider, uh, get pissed off about this uh, arrangement. Didn't like opening their all mandatorily opening all the routes to everyone else to the small peanuts that, that we were in, 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 in the party. Um, so they decided not to leave, but they decided to strangle all the links they have with the IXP. They reduced all the links they have with the IXP. So basically, we were, I remember, we were in a mandatory multilateral agreement. So by contract, we had to exchange our traffic with incumbents through the IXP, through these links that were artificially reduced, not cut. Because if they left, we could have used another route. But they didn't leave. They didn't leave. So for three months, because of the mandatory multilateral agreement that we set up, the Argentine uh, internet was a spirit that two networks that basically cannot see to each other, cannot communicate to each other. We had to review the contracts, we had to review the uh, bylaws, we had to review everything, make a lot of legal changes in order to, to start uh, sending the traffic for different routes. But that was a big, big, big price. The positive thing about this is that uh, we kept the, the multilateral and mandatory, but with small payments. We started incorporating the, the content providers there. And the, the IXP has started to expand to the regions where the incumbents were dominant, in order to retaliate for, for what they've done. Today, the Argentine IXP has 13 IXPs all over the, the country. The traffic has increased in the, in the last 10 years since this incident. The number of members has increased. And 
there is a lot of success stories that I can share how the prices have dropped, etc., etc., etc. Et but um, that is basically, I mean, roughly the story that I, I wanted to share. So when you have to, to deal with the creation of an IXP, it's not only that you have to sit down every single part, but also you have to think on the way that you're going to organize internally very carefully, very carefully. Otherwise, you are being, and we survive by chance. I mean, we could have done much worse if we, were, if we weren't just that lucky as we were. Thank you. So, so let's just rewind and talk about these terms and, and, and define them because they're, they're rather important. Um, simplistically, if you think of an internet exchange as a roundabout, uh, uh, a, a road structure with many inbound and outbound radial paths and the ability to come into it, circle around and exit on the appropriate path, in a, in, a, in, a, in a road, outside of any no entry or one way signs, you can come in anywhere and leave anywhere. And this is about equivalent to the multilateral peering agreements that, are, that exist on certain internet exchanges around the world. It means that anybody connecting can communicate with anybody else without exception. That has a problem for operators. Uh, the, the Argentinian case is one um, that involves an incumbent, um, but it could, in fact, just as simply involve a small player with a limited budget and inability to uh, expand in some way. So we deal with multiple different types of, of, of agreements that, that, that structure around the exchange. And when a multilateral peering agreement, which is normally defined by the internet exchange itself, doesn't exist, you end up with something called bilateral peering agreements, one-to-one -one agreements between the individual players. If there's three players at an exchange, then really there's only three uh, relationships, but when there's four players, then there's six relationships. When there's five players, well, the numbers continue to grow rather quickly. When you get to an exchange, a big exchange in Europe, you're talking about hundreds 300, 400, 500, 600 or more members, the number of individual agreements that may exist are very high. Now this could seem quite unmanageable, but there's actually some things that need to be kept into account. One, there are only a small handful of extremely large internet exchanges. And two, an agreement between two parties, between two networks, may well, in fact, normally always does, encompass all locations that they interconnect with. A large network in Europe peering with another large network in Europe may well peer in three or four or five cities, and one agreement covers them all. And then the reality, which was brought up in the OECD report last year, is that, in fact, a majority of these agreements are handshake agreements and don't, in fact, contain paperwork. They contain the basic knowledge that one operator is as vulnerable as the other operator when peering, and therefore both operators will be well behaved. And this works. This works thousands, if not tens of thousands of times over around the world. And in fact, actually, um, you really only, when you start getting to large backbones, do you start seeing um, uh, paperwork, terms of conditions, um, and, and other issues, none of which are that onerous, none of which are that bad. But the key point here is to, to point out that the agreement process in those cases is done outside of the internet exchange. The internet exchange focuses on the technical excellence of moving bits, of making sure fiber optic cables are connected to make sure the lights stay on and blink. The individual ISPs are then free to make their own arrangements amongst themselves, which, by the way, makes one of the most important aspects of any internet exchange its website. Because unless you have a page with a list of members and or a list of members plus their contact information, 
a connection to that internet exchange is fairly useless. The final point I want to make is one that up until now I've, I've talked about stuff that's just factual, but, but maybe something a little bit more controversial. It really isn't, however you look at internet exchanges, um, you can't force somebody to actually peer, to, to generate routes on the exchange, to transfer traffic. The multilateral peering agreements did it, but, but, but Argentina was not the only place where this kicked up around the world to cause problems. So the reality is that some players come to the internet exchange only to peer with a very select few of the set of players, and some to peer with everybody. It's okay. Any peering is good. The incumbent will always play the role of the incumbent and not want to play well. That actually isn't the case in some cities around the world. They actually play pretty nicely in London, Hong Kong. Uh, maybe that's the only two I can think of. Um, <laughs> but the point is that, 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 that um, even so, the power of the exchange, is, the benefit and the power of the exchange goes to those players that appear. And therefore, it is the smaller players at the peering exchanges which actually win hands down and in some cases can be so significant that they can ignore the incumbent um, uh, to a greater and greater extent. So just wanted to, 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 to place that on there. Thanks, Martin. Uh, we're the okay, thanks, Martin, for making most of the points I wanted to make. You're welcome. <laughs> I will still try to make a few points. Um, so I often describe it with, because NetNo does a a few different things and the, the exchange point status is uh, only one part of what we do. I often explain, uh, describe it as it's, it's, mo it's the simplest and most complex service that we provide. So it's simple because it's a piece of equipment. It's a switch. It's a, if you don't know what a switch is, it's a hub where several internet operators can plug in their cables and exchange traffic. That part is really, really simple simple. I liked your point about technical excellence, but I'd like to say that it's, it's a simple service that you don't need a lot of technical competence to, to, to run well. As you grow, it gets a bit more complex. But it's the most complex service in that um, it is more than just that connecting cables together. So a few people have, have touched upon that, and I think um, um, Internet exchange points need to be commu community builders. And that's what makes it so hard to start up an exchange point because you need people who understand the technical part, understand the technical benefits of, of, of uh, interconnecting, who understand the, the um, economic advantages as well, but also who uh, can go out and talk to people who can be community builders. And uh, I often hear, because NetNo does, uh, we, don't, we don't build exchange points in other parts of the world, but we work together with, with up and coming exchange points to support them. And what we often hear is that they, they say, okay, we just need to get the technical stuff done, because these are techies, right? We need to get the technical stuff done and then build it and they will come. And they get the technical stuff together and then it sits there and nothing happens. So um, what we try to tell them is that that's great. It's great that you have the technical competence. But first of all, you need the community. You need to convince these operators that there's a benefit in, in uh, exchanging traffic. And yes, they are competitors. And yes, they don't talk to each other. But that's where we need to start. They need to talk to each other. Once they start talking to each other, they might consider um, exchanging traffic. Um, but the other thing is also you need to, to have people who can then grow the community. It's great to have a few network operators there, but then you need to, to, to grow the community. Uh, we are great uh, believers in value-added services in, uh, at the exchange point. Um, so, by, so we have, um, like, like Byron was talking about, we, we run NTP, the official time service at the exchange point. So that's a value they get. And we run uh, the right routing registry at the exchange point. We host um, 
broadband, Swedish broadband testing service at the exchange point. And then, of course, we also host the iRoutService.net, the, one of the 13 DNS root servers at the exchange point. So there are benefits um, by being at the exchange, there are benefits um, just from that. I think um, it's also really important to understand that NICSP needs to be uh, a neutral space. Uh, again, because we're talking about a, a, an environment where competitors come together. So the role of the exchange point is also to install that trust in the community um, and, uh, and explain that there are mutual benefits um, for peering. So peering, if you don't know the term, it, it simply means exchanging traffic. Um, we also find that um, a little bit, actually, what, what Bevel was, was talking about, that there's a, there are a range of different benefits with peering at the exchange. So localization of traffic, saving costs, lower latency, but it also increased control of your traffic. If you, have, if you send your traffic through a transit provider up, you have no control what's happening after that. So by being at the exchange point, you can actually control the routing of your traffic. And not all those arguments will will uh, bite on all different players. Um, so you need to, to adjust your message depending on who you're speaking to. Um, and even though NetNode is, is an old exchange, uh, we find that we do a lot of community building, a lot of education still. We sit and explain to people what, what Martin was explaining about peering uh, agreements. We explain to them what the benefits are. We explain to them why it makes sense to them um, for them to peer with, with, with certain other peers, for example. Um, I think the main channel, uh, challenge is often getting um, the ISP to connect to the exchange. That first step, they have to make the business case, and then once they connect, I have so far never seen a traffic graph that goes down. Traffic increases. And... Um, you know, when we speak, we speak to members who have been a member for a while, you know, and we talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, explain the benefits, they connect, and they go, poof. And we say, I told you so. But that initial education is really important. Um, okay, so, so I love exchange points. I work for one. But um, I often hear that exchange points are the solution. And I'd like to say that it's not. Exchange points themselves, again, they're just, they're just a piece of equipment. But they're part of an ecosystem. Um, so it can revolutionize interconnection in parts of the world, but it need, it's one part of interconnection. You need the regulatory environment for that to work. You need and basic infrastructure, or infrastructure. You need the operators community, and you need competent, stable staff who will actually champion the, the exchange point. Uh, and you need the will. Um, but it's important that the ex exchange point stays open and ex inclusive. Um, I think the, the example in, in Canada is really interesting because a third party has gone in and acted as a catalyst. An exchange point needs to benefit the operator community. Once you stop doing that, it's going to die. So that's the main focus of an exchange point. And a, a third party can come in and set and, and help set it up, fund it, act as a catalyst. But the models, at least that I've seen, when someone else comes in and, and uh, runs it, creates the exchange point and runs it forever. With the, without the, the benefit of the operator's community in mind, are models that are, are likely to fail. Sorry. I'd just like to um, follow up on something that's been uh, popping up in the threads here. Um, when I was uh, working on the press release for the official signing ceremony of uh, you know, announcing the IXP to the world, I included a, a sentence or two about cost savings for consumers. And the regulator, quite canny and very worldly man, said, strike that sentence. We don't want to, you know, send anybody running away from the table just yet. 
Um, it, it clearly, the, the value proposition in terms of cost savings um, is self-evident. Um, but I'm just wondering how far the, the ripples actually reach. And I wonder if anybody here can comment on consumer gains, you know, like, like um, price reductions for consumers. Now, are, are they seeing any, any clear sort of relationship, correlation between the prevalence of IXPs, their use, and costs in retail um, internet? Thanks, Dan. I, I, I think that a number of the panelists might have an observation on that, but I, I'm going to intervene to start with and say that I think the trend is not that costs go down, but that people are given more capacity. That, that's one of the most commonly asked questions we get from the from a wide audience. Um, okay, is my internet price going to go down? And um, I too had to strike out a similar line out of one of the pieces for um, IX launch in the region. The provider's position, I understand, they, they repurpose the, the savings or the, the, the financial um, rewards of participating in the exchange. And so it's a capacity and quality of service improvement um, that customers can be guaranteed as opposed to looking out for, for price reduction. And, and to me, it makes sense. And it's a reasonable thing for the, the service providers to, to offer um, in return for their participation in the exchange. Um, customers can expect uh, much more efficient operation at the, at the local uh, traffic exchange level. And just to add to something that um, Rani said uh, concerning the location of other services at the exchange point, it also improves the, res the resilience of the local network. And um, when you start adding things like uh, the NS server um, and other um, server facilities at the, at the exchange, um, customers can also get a discernible improvement in certain sites um, you get content providers like Akamai, um, which I want to add, which I want to tie into something that was said earlier about the um, markets too small. Uh, when we first started this, Akamai, Google, and some of the other content providers um, were not interested in the um, smaller markets at all. Now they are, uh, and they're, they're willing to, to participate once an exchange point starts up, regardless of how many members, regardless of what's the traffic on the graphs. And I think that's a, a good point again because consumers benefit when that content comes from them. And so we now actively um, try to get um, content providers on as quickly as possible following the activation of um, the exchange points, which results in consumers or ordinary net users see tangible benefits um, to this mystery technical um, solution that they put out. Uh, thanks, Pebble. I know Moise wanted to say something, and I think we must uh, turn it over to the audience. And Moise, while, while you're at it, I think could you explain something that may be on the mind of some of the audience? Because uh, in many developing countries, we still see a situation where there's a single internet gateway. And I gather that's the, that's the situation in Tunisia. And so if everyone has to connect to ATI to get out to the rest of the world, why do you need an exchange? Just to put that just to be changed. Since we need since a year ago, we have now two gateways. One is owned by the, 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 the two gateways are owned by two operators. Now we are pushing the government to have some amendments which in order to get to all ISP. So we're pushing the government to have some regulatory reform in order to let all any ISP have its own gateway and the operator. And also we are pushing through the development of um, uh, internet exchange point. Our internet exchange point is to have more ads than it is. If you look at the ads, we can see few ads and say this is really stupid because we have much more actors and they don't ever want to be able to public ads and they to stay private ads not really a real situation. And it is because of the history also, because ITI used to be a single ad sent for the country. We have 2609 was the ad sent for the whole country maintained by ITI. Now we are changing and we are pushing the other ISPs to have to, to be with us or to connect with us via the internet exchange point with their own eyes. So it is a step by step approach. We are pushing the actors to, to do so. But uh, what I want to mention also is about the value of internet exchange. It's not a matter of connectivity. Only. As, I, as, I, as I mentioned before, it's the engagement of the community and the engagement of the society. So we don't want also to be only an association that could serve only the actors, but the members and the ISPs and the and so on. But we want also to involve much more activities for the community to 
to let them them in, engage with their identity at the same point. They have to highlight the value of an identity key in a country like mine. You know, uh, what is important for an application must be we, we built an open innovation lab which should be also in the same umbrella as the city. So it is an open innovation lab between say the four or four lab and the whole factory is very active with hackers and, and uh, also with uh, development and of an but we can say also that uh, for, for the audit open innovation lab it could be copied by uh, the mirrors, open source mirrors. We are also promoting that. So within the internet exchange, we choose to be uh, these kind of servers and platforms used to be maintained by ITI. But ITI is a commercial based company now, so it's changing it's not an agency anymore. So that's why we're pushing it to do via the Internet Exchange Point Association to make it better. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're running out of time, so Sebastian. Thank you. Yeah, regarding the uh, drop, the, the price, the, the price that are was uh, asked. Yeah, we see a, a, a trend to that. Uh, it's not necessarily in the, in the short term, it could be in the long term. Uh, we have a study on the impact of uh, the creation of IXP in Kenya, in Kenya and Nigeria, uh, which was so. Uh, Michael Kennedy, of the is uh, our expert in numbers and in IXP too. So. I mean, I, w I will not enter into, into the details because he's here and I will make a mess. Um, so, uh, that's something I, I would like to contact. I mean, that's, uh, we have a document on that. We are releasing a document on, on the impact of uh, the creation of IXPs in Latin America, specifically in uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Argentina, Brazil. Uh, so, it's going to be next week. Okay, next week is going to be released. So, that's also going to be available on, in our website. And, uh, and I recall one case, I mean, uh, when the uh, Neuquén in Argentina, in the Patagonia, we set up the, the first IXP outside Buenos Aires was set up in the city called Neuquén, which is 1,000 kilometers south from Buenos Aires in the, in the Patagonia, in the very beginning of the Patagonia. Uh, that IXP served another city, which is a key resort called San Martín de los Andes, which is 400 kilometers further south. Uh, the price drop for the, I, 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 for the ISP in San Martín de los Andes went from $400 per bag to $90 automatically um, per bag. And, but they didn't translate automatically that into price cuts because the first uh, time they linked to the, to the uh, ISP is in a microwave link. So they used that money in order to, to, to uh, plant fiber to replace the, 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 wire, the wireless link and, and, and to have their own fiber connection to the IXP. Once they connected, I mean, they made the investment in order to, to get in full steam with the, with the IXP, they started dropping the prices to the But as Pevil and many others said, the benefits for the users were automatic, were automatic. Not necessarily in, in price terms, but uh, in capacity or other other terms. But, uh, in the long term, we, we, we see that there, there is a price drop associated with the creation of our industry. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. Yes, and in fact, also, the cost savings can go into uh, investment to increase the coverage of the network in areas where people have had no, no access to the internet before. Um, is there any way questions from the audience? Uh, you may have to... oh, a great panel. And a lot of insights. I am Anupam Madhurwar and I saw Ambassador 230 IGF. So the question is, uh, we got a lot of insights in terms of uh, what happened from the regulator side and the ISP community. But do you have an example where the user community has put pressure for, on the ISPs to interconnect and use IXPs? Anyone in the panel uh, experience with the consumer groups pressuring for IXPs? Uh, it seems to be an unusual situation. <laughs> uh, it seems to be an intervention they are about this matter. Um, Jamie Badley, NZIX. We had an example where the incumbent refused to pay. Uh, what we did to create consumer pressure on the incumbent was partnered with the national broadcaster to release specific content only on the ISPs. 
then what we did is we did a unicast deployment of that content on the other side of Pacific. So for the incumbent that wasn't peering, their customers were required to drag down the national broadcaster traffic from the US, whereas uh, other ISPs who were peering picked it up locally. So all of the consumers of um, ISPs that were peering locally had good performance from the national broadcaster and the non-peering ISPs did not. Great example, thank you. Um, I think there's a question down the Sure. Let me make one confession. Uh, um, I was caught in the, the, this room uh, trying to finalize my document because it, apparently it has good uh, Wi-Fi. And then, uh, then I started listening uh, what uh, you have been uh, discussing, and I realized that this session was more on diplomacy, negotiation, and persuasion than on technological issue. Lovely story from Vanuatu about four years of the of the persuasion. And I'm from Diplo Foundation, and we work on uh, basically uh, bridging the gap between diplomacy and, and the technical issues and internet governance. And it, it, it was a fascinating session. And my suggestion is to try to debrief uh, your collective experience and wisdom around the table and prepare something uh, uh, about the uh, lessons on persuasion, empathy development, listening, and engagement through this process of developing the Thank you. Oh, oh, thanks. I think Jane can say something about that. <laughs> um, my name is Jane Coffin, and um, I'm with the Internet Society and some of the collective colleagues from the Internet Society and everyone at this table, and those of you that are in the room, we might hit up later. We do have a study underway, and this is thanks to a, a generous grant from the Google Foundation, completely tech neutral. We are at our own, I want to be very clear about that. Um, we are putting together an ISP best practices and toolkit study, a portal to accompany that, and training. Um, Mike is one of the leads in the drafting the report and putting together a benchmarking methodology and looking at beginning advanced, more advanced ISPs. So this is coming out soon, likely at the end of this year, and um, we're trying to create collective wisdom in that report, but also will be it's a uh, it'll be a living process. A living document. So next year we'll be continuing that, continuing it, and getting more case studies. We're looking for blogs, economic information. We're so excited that Michael joined the Internet Society um, as our chief economist because there are some economic factors, as Sebastian has mentioned, and that everyone at the table has seen. But we also want to highlight all of the great actors like the Packet Clearinghouse, the IXPs here, CIRA. Uh, there's a fellow sitting over there I want to recognize, Nick Hilliard from um, INEX uh, in Ireland. It's the Internet Neutral Exchange, not the Irish Exchange. <laughs> but Nick has a piece of open source software that does back office IXP management. I'll let him explain that. We also have links at the table here with us, um, Malcolm Huddy. There's lots of experience around the world. And of course, Gani Skaris from Indonesia, who's very involved in IXP development. So just to, as an advertisement, well, we thank you for the diplomacy issue. But there's a lot that goes on, and uh, we're trying to capture it. We may not get it right the first time around, but we're going to try and keep bringing in that collective wisdom. Thank you. I like the diplos in the room. Didn't know that. So I've been involved in the peering world for for a long time. Um, mid-90s when if I look at what we do today compared to then it was so trivial it wasn't even funny and peering was very much the world of the, of the network engineers the geeks the, 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 the two engineers sitting down and, and getting bits to, tr to travel and in fact actually a lot of those nowadays incumbents actually were, were early peering players until management got involved. A, a lot of the early ISP work that was done inside some of the, the telcos around the world was really done, you know, not front and center, but was done by small engineering groups. But I have a confession to make, as much as I am a techie. I was a techie. I haven't touched a piece of network equipment in a long time. I don't need to because I've got a good crew and I know that the other networks can, can replicate what I've said. Peering has absolutely, at the high level, become a game of diplomacy. 
it is the use of the word peer to players that are equal. That doesn't mean they want to talk, but if one, if the ice is broken and they can communicate and they can negotiate, good things happen. It is sometimes the case of a smaller player convincing a larger player that there is value in an interconnect between the two networks and succeeding at that argument. There are sometimes, quite frankly, and I, I, I'm not going to use the word bullying, but large bandwidth flows, which just, we gave an example out of New Zealand, um, that, that can instigate solutions and peering. All of those are negotiations of different varieties. And it turns out that the geek-led internet community, as much as it's very good at peering, when you start getting to the higher echelons, when you start seeing those larger, um, let's say some of the very large video streaming sites that exist now, or some of the backbones that have grown up and still want to talk to, to, to what are now those telcos, those incumbents, um, it's very much a game of diplomacy. And yet, ultimately, it's about moving clean bits. Um, this room, by the way, has some of the best Wi-Fi. The other one that's really good is upstairs at the back, but that's above the knock, which is why it's good. Um, um, but, but the point I'm, I'm going to make is that, that if you actually go ultimately down and talk to, to players running internet exchanges or running backbones with large amounts of peering, um, you get down to a set of engineers and, and, and a set of, of managers who are all about high quality internet bits. They may fall apart in the last you know, mile or the last few hundred feet as they hit Wi-Fi or whatever, but in the core when you talk to internet folks, you will realize that the peering world is all about making sure there's enough capacity that routing is efficient and that there is truly the ability to to just not drop bits because that's the worst crime. That's the worst. If you're in the internet backbone business, you don't want to drop bits. So negotiation comes out to be one of the bigger players, more so than the technology. It's easy. Narani said it. Oh no, he said it was hard. Yeah, never mind. I just want to add one quick thing, and I know, Jovan, that you're into, you, you're into, um, you like research and studies, and there are, there is interesting research done in this area um, that studies, so not the IXP part, but, but the peering part and, uh, among the operators, what makes um, operators exchange traffic. And so I've listed a few arguments um, here, um, but it shows that the social part plays an incredibly important role when negotiating peering agreements. And uh, so they're, they're great studies that, that show that a lot of sometimes very rational, sometimes not very rational factors lay, lie behind the decision to, to peer with another operator. So there's, I can point you to some fascinating reading. Well, I should have addressed this meeting as uh, your excellence and real excellence, not just the forum one. Uh, thanks very much. I'm afraid we have run out of time. Is there any other burning comments or, or observations? Um, I think we must uh, applaud the panel for a, for a very interesting session.